Strober, aka the world's first dark skin activist. That's right, aka the inventor of dark skin activism. And you guys are tuned in to a dark skin woman's revenge live with the dark skin activist Rashida Strober. I want to thank y'all for taking the time out of y'all busy life, your busy evening, to check me out to hear what I gotta say. This is my Black History Month special. This is my uh, Black History Month talk. I got, now, I'm going to tell y'all the truth now. I got people that's been calling me, you know, asking me where I'm get started, and they've been calling me about this show all night. So if I get a phone call, I, in fact, I talked about my friend, my good friend, Theo. He just called me because he knew that I was going to be talking about him and what happened uh, like on, on Christmas Day. It was actually on, no, it was Christmas Eve. He went to jail and some racist, some real racist bullshit went down when he went to a Texas jail. And I'm going to be talking about that tonight. Matter of fact, I got my yellow book right here. I have an agenda for you guys tonight. And I'm going to be telling you guys, see, a lot of people, they hate on me. You know, they say I'm crazy. They say I'm dividing the race. They say I don't have a lot of space here on my desk here, but they say all these things about me. But I'm going to let y'all know tonight why there is a need for a dark skin activist. I'm going to let y'all know tonight why I am here, why I do what I do. You know, I don't worry about people hating on me because this has been going on. The hate has been going on for at least the past two and a half years. I've been the dark skin activist, like I let people know, since 1998. I started back at St. Petersburg Junior College during Harambe, where I gave a speech on the beautiful Alec Weck, the beautiful Sudanese jet black dark skin model that black people at that time were hating on, calling her ugly, calling her manly, um, saying that she was not the real representation of what black is, black is, black female beauty is. And I spoke out on that at Harambe back in 1998 at St. Petersburg Junior College. And that is where my activism started. But I started to notice a pattern of dark skin discrimination, what I call darkism. In fact, that's right. I am working on a book called Darkism. In fact, I've been working on it for the last year and a half. Had to put it down, come back to it, put it down and come back to it because I have a whole bunch of different projects going on. But Darkism, which is a a term I coined, Darkism, is a case where people discriminate against you because you're dark skinned. And it could be in relationships. It could be in jobs. It could be in school. It could be in housing, in all facets of life. So what I'm going to be talking to you guys tonight I'm going to be talking to you guys primarily about darkism and how darkism is carried out. And if we're honest with ourselves, black people and white people and and whoever, you know, whoever you are that's watching this program, if we're honest with our, especially the black people, if we're honest with ourselves, we know that darkism exists. I mean, it's it's just it's just as plain and simple and it's as clear as day. Darkism exists. It's real. OK, so I got a list here. Um, of some things that I want to cover that I want to make sh- sure I go in on tonight. Um, uh, let me just get to it because a lot of people have been coming at me. They've been sending me messages on Facebook. They've been emailing me, asking me how I feel about this whole Beyonce situation. And I got some pictures for y'all tonight that I pulled up and I'm going to be doing some little screen sharing here. So y'all going to have to bear with me because I got to be, I got to get myself together um, on a technological level. But basically how I feel about Beyonce is I don't respect her. I don't respect her because let me tell you guys why. Beyonce is the benefactor light skin privilege or well, non skin privilege. I've been calling it non dark skin privilege. I have to say that on Facebook because I have a lot of haters that sit back and watch my post. They pissed off that I'm bringing this issue to the forefront. And so what they do is they, they, uh, they, they report my post, you know, so I have to come up with different terms and phrases to talk about what I want to talk about in a different way. But back to Beyonce, I didn't really even want to talk about Beyonce because to me, she's not even that important for me to talk about on an intellectual level. You know, I kind of just dismissed her from my mind unless some Somebody continues to bring it up, and then I say, I, I look at this situation. I gotta speak on this because it is an example of darkism, it is an example of light skin privilege. So, this whole thing with the Super Bowl, I don't watch the Super Bowl, I don't watch TV, you know. So, I didn't see the whole dance routine that she did, but people have told me about it. And the part that 
that struck me was the part of her calling herself, I guess, paying homage to the Black Panther Party. It was a slap in the face because the dark-skinned women in the Black Panther Party have never been given a just due as far as I'm concerned. The only dark-skinned woman that I could uh, that comes to mind when I think about the Black Pan- Panther Party is Afeni Shakur. And I believe that Afeni Shakur has gotten the respect that she's gotten because she is the, the mother of Tupac Shakur. But there's a, a brother in Chicago about six months ago. There's a brother coming into the room. Come on, Lauren. You coming in? Excuse me, y'all. I guess she don't want to come in. <laughs> anyway, there's a brother in Chicago that um, told me, because I was, I was on a rampage trying to find dark-skinned women, because I know it was a bunch of dark-skinned women in the Black Panther Party, but they never got the recognition that I feel that they were due. And of course, we all know it was because of darkism or otherwise known as colorism or whatever you want to call it. You can choose the term darkism that I coined, the world's first dark skinned activist, Rashida Strober, the activism, or you could choose colorism. The fact remains that these dark skinned women never got their just due like the non dark skinned women. So you see people like Kathleen Cleaver that were at the forefront of this movement speaking. In fact, somebody sent me a video. Um, they tagged me in a video where Kathleen Cleaver was speaking on this whole black is beautiful thing and you know, going on and on about um, black women gotta declare their beauty and she had all these dark skinned women behind her. And to me, I'm, I'm just gonna tell y'all straight up, dark skinned women need to represent dark skinned women's beauty. And like I've always said, and I'm not gonna say it, it's no hate, it's no shade, it's just the truth. Dark skin, kinky hair is the real representation of Africa. So for uh, Beyonce, and then she has the nerve to wear this blonde weave. How you gonna wear a blonde weave you know, and you call yourself representing or paying homage to the Black Panther Party when all those women did was walk around with huge afros in their hair. And then she had the dark skinned women standing behind her, you know, like she leading them where she was, but she would never lead me like that. Those dark skinned women are, are, are not conscious of the real deal. That's why I say I don't respect her. You come in with blonde weave in your hair, you, you, you non dark skin, okay? Um, you know, you, you, you're carrying on the legacy of colorism that existed in the Black Panther Party because you want to be the leader. You want to be the leader of these females. And I don't respect you for that. You're jumping on the bandwagon of black oppression. You know, what dark skinned people, the vast majority of these people that were suffering were dark skinned people. Even going back to Ka- Kathleen Cleaver. Have you guys looked into the history of Kathleen Cleaver? She was from the upper middle class. Okay. And that's that's the situation that you have in a lot of these black movements where it is the upper class that are always leading the lower class black people. And a lot of those people, the uh, I would say the great majority of those people that are in the upper class are non dark skin. So why in the hell would I respect Beyonce for calling herself jumping on the Black Panther Party bandwagon when you have already been the benefactor? of light skin privilege your whole life your whole life you know she couldn't even step aside i remember the situation with the singer lettucey who sung the title song she played like one of the main characters in selma and it was reports that beyonce went to john legend and common and basically demanded that she sing the song and lettucey did not get her shine now if you really cared about your dark skin sisters you know why would you do that why wouldn't, you, why, why wouldn't you give the spotlight to this dark-skinned woman who actually sang the song in the movie, who actually was in the movie as one of the title characters? Why would you go and steal her shine? I don't respect Beyonce. It's fake. It's not real. It's capitalizing off of the sufferings, the historical sufferings of dark-skinned people. And it's bullshit. And I'm calling it how it is. And so for all you Beyonce fans, and just so y'all know, when I made, when people kept asking me over and over, how you feel about Beyonce? They sent me all these, all these messages. So I said, okay, I'm going to finally speak my piece on it. And I probably made about five or six posts and they was just unfriending me left and right. Well, you know what? All you Beyonce fans that can't handle the truth, that's your problem. That's not mine. You know, what you need to do is go sit down and read a book. What you need to do is go study up on black history, on African history. And then you can put this stuff in context. 
you know, if you if, if you understood the history of the Black Panther Party and what they stood for, the women damn sure wouldn't walk was not walking around with a head full of blonde weave in their damn hair. I can tell you that right now. And all you got to do is do a Google search and you can see how they looked. Back to this dark skinned woman named Stephanie Green that the brother, um, a brother from um, he's on Facebook, a brother from Chicago. He told me about Stephanie Green and he sent me a picture of Stephanie Green and nobody knows who Stephanie Green is. Why? She's dark skinned. She's she was too black, too dark, too kinky haired to be at the forefront of the movement. So now you have a situation where years later, the same cycle is repeating itself with non-dark skinned women at the forefront, a non-dark skinned woman at the forefront, Beyonce, a woman that has, like I said, been the benefactor of light skin privilege for all these years. Let me um, go to, let me, let me just show y'all something. Just bear with me for a second because I want to screen share here with you. I actually, um, I'm doing my entire screen. went and got a picture and I hope you guys could see this. I hope this does not go out of Beyonce. Hold on one moment. In all her glory, and so I can show you guys how she looked, how ridiculous this woman looks walking around with blonde weave in her hair. Look at look at this. I hope y'all can see that. Look at how ridiculous that looks. This woman is walking around with loud blonde weave in her hair. She got the dark, some of the dark skinned women in the background with the afros, and she's leading the pack. Like I said, it's the same situation that happened back in the 60s with Kathleen Cleaver, this light skinned woman you know, leading the pack. She didn't have the weave in her head, but nonetheless, why do you feel the need to lead dark skinned women? Dark skinned women need to lead themselves and get themselves out of their own oppression. And let me just show y'all the picture of Lettucey. I want y'all to see who Lettucey is, who Beyonce last year stole the shine from when she decided that she was going to be the one. This is Lettucey. She's dark skinned. The lighting there has has her looking a little bit lighter, but she's the one that played a main character in Selma, the movie Selma, and she sung um, the title song that Beyonce sung. I cannot remember the name of the song, but anyway, like I said, Beyonce, she went to uh, John Legend and Common, and John Legend, there was some reports that said John Legend and Common, they were reported as saying, um, who turns Beyonce down? Okay, I'm gonna stop the screen sharing. I hope you guys saw that. I hope you guys, I hope you guys saw the pictures that I was just showing you. You know, so that's how I feel about Beyonce. I feel that Beyonce is an opportunist. I feel that she doesn't really truly care about uh, black people. I feel that she just wants to uh, tie herself to anything that's going to bolster her status and make her look good. It's not really about the people because if it was really about the people. Then why is, um, let's go back to Destiny's Child, for example. Why were the darker skinned girls in the group mistreated? Why? Why weren't they treated equally? Why, are, why is Beyonce a big, huge pop star to this day and Kelly is not? Why is Beyonce a big, huge pop star worldwide and the other girls that got kicked out of Destiny's Child, why are they not? So if you were so concerned about black people, why don't you have a track record of working in solidarity and true solidarity with black women, with dark skinned women who you know bear the brunt of the ugly problems, branded ugly. We, you know, ugly, manly, all these things we get called the darker skinned women do. You know, if you really cared, then why don't you step back? Why do you keep trying to step over other dark skinned women's toes? Why you, why you keep trying to take away their shine? She even did that to Jennifer, same thing with Jennifer Hudson. You know what I'm saying? So this woman has a track record of inauthenticity and I don't buy it. I don't respect it. And I'm coming from the perspective of a dark skinned female who I can clearly see what this woman, how this woman is benefited in terms of her, her light skin. And I don't see her giving back. I don't see her as a real true person giving back. Like I said, she's a fucking opportunist. You know, and it's just not right. It, at the end of the day, it's not right. So now y'all know how I feel about the whole Beyonce situation. I don't respect her. I probably never will respect her. I will never buy her music. She doesn't represent as a black woman for me. She's not the essence of what a real black woman is. I am dark skin, kinky hair, 
the real representation of what it means to be Afrocentric. That's how I feel about Beyonce. So I'm moving right along. So I have some other topics that I want to talk to you guys about. Um, oh my gosh, my light. <laughs> Y'all got to excuse my light there. So the other night, last night, in fact, and this really pissed me off. Really, it just it just made me so upset, you know, that in 2016, we are still dealing with colorism in the black community so damn thick you can cut it with a knife. And that's why I say more reasons why there's a need for a dark skinned activist. I'm not going anywhere because darkism is impacting the next generation. Let me explain to y'all why and how. There's a show on Lifetime that I happened to watch last night called The Rap Game. And it's, it's basically a show where Jermaine Dupri is choosing, uh, he has a competition where he's choosing some teenagers, some, some black children, teen, well, black children. I don't know if we want to even, black children and some mixed race children. Excuse me, y'all what it's like. Um, who he wants to sign to his record label. So basically, they are competing. They're going through a series of competitions, of rapping competitions, writing, all kinds of different competitions. But what pissed me off, and see, I don't have no problem. See, people think I hate light-skinned people. Let's clear that up. I don't hate anybody. What I hate is inequality. What I hate is discrimination. And like I said before, Black people, if we are honest with ourselves, and this is Black History Month, so we need to take a look at ourselves and be honest. If we are honest with ourselves, we know that dark skin discrimination runs rampant in the black community all across the world. So back to this situation with the rap game, which is the name of the show. And I took some notes on this because I wanted to make sure I, I made all my points. So I don't have a problem with, you know, these children who are not dark skin, the brown skin was whatnot. But like I said, what I have a problem with, there was no visibly phenotypically dark skin child with kinky hair on the show. And I know damn well, I know damn well that in the tryouts, I know that it had to be, you know, a lot of dark skinned children that was trying out for the show. No one can, can convince me that it wasn't. So how in the world do you end up with all these children and you have no dark skin, no visually, physically dark skinned black children with kinky hair on the show? So let me get to my notes. Okay, another thing that I take issue with, see, black people, we let other people come into our community and capitalize off of our creativity. So another thing that I took issue with when I watched this show is Jermaine Dupri had a Chinese woman as his assistant, as his, as his assistant, excuse me. Let me drink a little, little bit of tea here, y'all. Now, I live in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I'm telling you, it's a ton of Chinese restaurants around here. It's a ton of uh, hair supply stores ran by the Chinese. And I'm telling you right now, you'll be hard pressed to see black people who, who basically fuel the, 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 the hair industry. We fuel it. If it wasn't for our money, they asses would be out of business. But you rarely see them. You rarely see black people working in Chinese hair supply stores. Now, sometimes you do, granted. I will say that. But it's very rare. So now... I look up and I see Jermaine Dupri with this Chinese assistant telling, sitting up here telling these kids about um, uh, what they need to do and acting like she's some type of authority on rap music. You're not an authority on rap music. It, it started in the hood with black people, okay? With darker skin, oppressed black people, I argue. Some of y'all are going to disagree with me on that, but... I'm dealing with the truth here. So I took issue with that. He could have had a black woman on there. You know what I'm saying? All these black women are so underrepresented in, in hip hop. You know what I'm saying? In the working world. So, you know, you mean to tell me you couldn't find one black woman to be your assistant, to give her a job, to give her an opportunity? You see, I have a problem with a lot of these black men, a lot of these, you know, high powered, high level black men that put every single other race of women on, especially in the entertainment industry and in high level industries in high level positions. But when it comes down to putting a black woman on a dark skinned black woman in particular on, they got a problem with that. So Jermaine Dupree, you dead ass wrong for that one. 
So that's the number one thing I took issue with. The number two thing I took issue, well, actually the number one thing I took issue with was there was no dark skin child with kinky hair, nappy hair, visibly phenotypically dark skin. Let's be real clear. Um, uh, let's see what else. The message. That's another thing. The me- this show sends a, a, a really screwed up message to dark skinned children that I'm not good enough to be on in the spotlight, you know, because a lot of us, we look at TV, we look at these TV stars and we look at these people as if, you know, they're God, they're important. You know, they somebody. And in order for me to be somebody, I need to link up with them or I need to be on TV. You know, you're dealing with the minds of the youth. Young people are young and impressionable. So this 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 uh this rap game show, what kind of message are you fucking sending to dark skinned children? That pissed me off. I have a dark skinned daughter. What if she grows up and decides she wants to be a rapper? You know what I'm saying? What if she grows up and decides she wants to be um a, a singer? You know what I'm saying? Is she gonna have to feel like, oh, I'm not, I'm too dark, I'm too black? You know what I'm saying? To be a rapper, I'm too black to 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 have a, a a black man in the industry support me. You know what I'm saying? It's fucked up. The message that he's sending to young, dark-skinned black kids, black boys, and black girls is dead ass wrong. Like I said, you mean to tell me you couldn't put one dark-skinned black boy or dark-skinned black girl with kinky hair on this show? Absolutely fucking lutely ridiculous. So Moving right along. Oh, let me talk about this manager here. This his name was Shane. That's his name. Black guy. Black guy named Shane. Bright skin. Okay. His daughter was mixed race. And this is another thing that I didn't like. See, like I said, everybody is allowed to come in and steal our swag, steal our culture, steal our you know our ways of being. Everyone is allowed to do that. And this is something that I looked at the show and I said, you know what? I analyzed and I said, what they're trying to do, they're trying to elicit sympathy in the hearts and the minds of the people so that this person can win. And like I said, I ain't got no problem with these children of different hues being on the show. It's really a matter of fairness and dark skin discrimination because the darker skinned children were not represented. So with that being said, this black guy that had a 16 year old daughter, she's mixed race. He had her from a white woman. They showed the, the, a little snippet of the story of the black guy and the white woman who had this 16-year-old child, how she was born. And she was, you know, basically talking about how when, when her mom, her white mom got pregnant from this black man, the people in her community, the white people in the community, and people were saying, you know, they, they were against it, basically. They were saying all kinds of negative things. And, you know, she was saying, you know what? My mom had to go through all of this and I'm strong and blah, 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 blah. And it was pretty much um, stated in a way to elicit sympathy and empathy from the audience. And what I didn't like is the fact that her dad, his interaction with black women on the show, you know, and after I realized that, okay, that's his daughter. His daughter is biracial, which means obviously you were with a white woman. You don't like black women too slick. He was coming slick out the mouth to most of the, in fact, all of the black women, because there were, there were other managers. They were, the dad was the manager and there were other moms that were managing their children's rap career is what they were doing. And so this, this manager, Shane, he was coming slick out the mouth to the black women that were in the house. He was just very arrogant and rude and disrespectful. And when they, they ran one that his baby mama, because I don't recall them saying that they were ever married, so I'm going to call her his baby mama. When they ran the clip explaining that his baby mama was a white woman, then I understood why. The fucking arrogance and the fucking nerve of this guy. And he kept saying, oh, his daughter is better than everyone in the house. And you know what? And I'm not saying this because she's, she was mixed race. I'm going to say this because it's the truth. She was not the best rapper in the house. The best rapper in the house was the black girl. This was a brown-skinned black girl. She wasn't dark-skinned. She was brown skin. I can't remember. It's going to come to me. Her name is going to come to me. Super, super, super something. But anyway, the brown skin black girl was actually the best one in the house in terms of her raw talent and rap skills. I will say that. There was another black man um, that was in the house. He, his, his baby mama, and it wasn't clear. And I, I, if, if I'm calling them baby mamas and they're the wives, 
then my apologies. But it wasn't clear as to whether or not these men were actually married to these women. So anyway, there was a another black man in the house. He was managing his daughter, who was a up and coming rap star, and his baby mama or wife. She was she looked mixed race. She looked um, ambiguous. You know, she wasn't authentically black or she wasn't dark skinned. You couldn't tell. She was mixed with something. And so the little girl, she had hair like um, Chili from TLC. She had that look going, that mixed up look going. And, you know, I'm just looking at this and I'm just saying to myself, wow, you know, the perpetuation of colorism is so real. They just won't stop. You know, it goes from generation to, to generation to generation to generation and never stopped. Started all the way back during slavery and after. And now after all this that we don't went through as black people, it's starting with the next generation of kids. You know, and it, it, it was just it was just really, you know, sickening to me that dark skinned children can't even get an opportunity. You know, they can't even get an opportunity because they're dark skinned. And for those of you that say, oh, well, you know, uh, well, maybe they couldn't, they couldn't, they just, you know, they didn't have, they couldn't have, didn't have any dark skinned children to put on the show. That's a lie. That's a lie. If you even look, if you go on YouTube, there are all kinds of young people out there of all skin hues, including dark skin, that are putting out their songs on the internet trying to get recognized, trying to get noticed. That's why I said there's no way and nobody could tell me that they couldn't have had at least one dark-skinned, authentically black, dark-skinned, kinky-haired child on that show. It's just unfair, folks. And we know this in the black community. We know this. You know, I, I, I have people that disagree with me all the time. Like I said, they tell me I'm dividing the race. I hate light-skinned people. I hate people. I don't hate anybody. Again, let me be clear. I love all people. I don't care what color you are. What I hate is darkism, the discrimination of a person based on their dark skin tone. It's wrong, folks. So what I want to do is show y'all something right now. I'm going to screen share again. I'm going to show y'all the cast of the rap game so you guys can see, so you can clearly see what I'm talking about. So just, just bear with me because I'm, um, I'm about to screen share again. And I got to work on my technology skills here. So y'all just bear with me, okay? You guys are about to see exactly what I'm talking about. I'm showing you guys the cast of the rap game with no visibly dark-skinned children. All right. So as you guys can see, there's Jermaine Dupree in the middle, okay? There, this is the, this young lady right here is the... Um, she's the daughter of the, 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 his name is Shane. That's his name. She's the daughter of the manager, Shane, the one that I was telling you about, the one that was acting so nasty towards the, the black women that were in the house who were managing their kids as well. Um, this little girl right here, I hope you guys can see her. She is the daughter of a man who has a, uh, ambiguous looking baby mama or wife or whatever she is to him. I don't know if they're married. Like I said, if they're married, I apologize. Um, this little girl right here, she's brown skin. She, as you can see, she's not dark skin. Uh, this bo little boy right here, he's brown skin. This little boy right here, he looks like he's mixed. So as you guys could see, clearly there are no, this is the cast of the rap game and there are no visibly dark skin black children with kinky hair. And it's a damn shame. It's darkism at its finest. Okay, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to stop the screen sharing. And I'm back. I hope you guys saw the picture. You, you see it right down your face. Hold on one second. Closing my door. Right there in your face. You know, darkism right there in your face. And people wonder why I get so pissed because, again, it's about opportunity. It's about access to opportunity. And what this show is saying is if you dark skin, we don't fucking want you. We don't want to be bothered. That's pretty much what this show is saying to young, dark skinned children. In fact, I was just talking to somebody today about Jermaine Dupree. I remember there was a song um, that this young, dark skinned girl was singing. 
she was on his record label or something like that. He, she was in the, he was in the video with her. Her name was Fundisha. And she was singing a song called Basketball. And it was for some type of movie soundtrack. And I believe it was back in 2000. And she was supposed to be coming out. I remember seeing a couple of interviews with her where she was talking about how she was supposed to be coming out with um, an album and some more songs. And I heard, I never heard from that girl again. Her name was Fundisha. Never. Y'all can even go and Google it. Y'all can find the, 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 uh, the video on YouTube. Fundisha Basketball. I have not heard from that girl since back in 2000, 2001, 2002, since that song came out. I live in St. Petersburg, Florida, and racism and darkism and all these isms are so thick in Florida that you could cut it with a knife. So you could be doing something as simple as shopping, minding your business, going to get food, doing whatever you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis, and here comes someone with some form of darkism. So I'm in Publix, which I like to shop in Publix, and I'm, I'm going to get something from the freezer, and there's this white woman. She's standing there with a, a buggy full of food. She's got her husband there, and I'm walking up just normally just to get some food, and she stops. She looks at me, and she jumps. And I look at her like, what in the shoe jumping for? You know, I had to catch myself because it really pisses me off because I've been dealing with this type of foolishness, this type of darkism my whole life. And you, you become so sensitive to these things when it's something that you just have to deal with over and over and over and over again. You can't just be like a normal person. You can't live a normal life. You can't just, you know, get up and just walk in a store like a normal person would do without somebody exhibiting some form of darkism on you. And I'm just going in the store, minding my damn business, trying to get me some food and I'm walking up and it's ugly. And she was ugly. She was an ugly white woman. Yes, she was. She was ugly as, hold on, hold on one second. She was ugly as fuck. I'll say that. Ugly white bitch. I'll say that. Yep. She damn sure didn't look better than me, but they act like they're just so superior to you. Like you're so, like you, like you're so different. Like you, like you an animal. You know what I'm saying? That's the feeling that I get from them. And, you know, don't try to invalidate my feelings. Because like I said, I've been going through this bullshit my whole life. Only recently, I decided to open my mouth and speak my truth and talk about these motherfuckers and expose what they do. And what I'm going to start doing, I'm going to start recording their asses so I can let people see. I can let people know just how racist some of these white people is. So anyway, I'm walking up there getting my food and she's standing her ass at the um in the freezer thing looking ugly as I don't know what. It had a nerve to jump at me cuz I walked up. Cuz you see a dark black jet black kinky haired woman walk up and you can't you can't you can't handle that contact me that um they have dark skin issues and I always take time and I talk to them because I know how it is. I know how it is to feel alienated, you know, um to feel like somebody is going to say, oh, you jealous or it's all in your head or you crazy. I know how that feels because people have done that to me. So I take time to talk to people about any dark skin issue. And that was one of my lovely fans calling me and letting me know that, you know, he's listening in to the show. Thank you very much. You know who you are. Anyway, continuing right along. So, yeah, this ugly white girl, she's so ugly. And I'm not saying all white women are ugly. I'm not even going to sit up here and say that. But I'm just saying this woman was ugly on the outside and she was ugly on the inside because, you know, what you jumping for? You jumping because you are racist. You, I mean, I haven't done anything to you. I'm not walking up on you to try to rob you. And that's the thing. A lot of black men need to understand that this whole phenomenon of these white people acting like they're scared when you come around them. It doesn't just happen to black men. It happens to black women, too, particularly dark skinned black women like me. They feel threatened by me. You know what I'm saying? And, I, and I, I'm trying to figure out what in the hell is these white people afraid of when they have a track record of being the most violent fucking people on the planet. They go around the world warring with other people. They've been warring with themselves. You know what I'm saying? For for the longest. So how you how you feel threatened by me? Oh, probably because of all the, the, the sins and atrocities that your ancestors have inflicted upon black people and that you're benefiting off of from the infliction of all these atrocities that happened during slavery and before. You know what I'm saying? So 
Yeah, that whole situation in public just pissed me the fuck off. I'm telling you, I was so mad that day. I had to catch myself because if I go off, if I if I if I go off, it ain't gonna be nothing nice. I'm telling you right now. You know, I've been, and I've been. I'm talking about verbally. See, I, ain't, I never have to get violent with anyone. I don't. I don't have to do that. I have to get. I don't even believe in violence at all. But I believe that, I, and I know my words can cut like a knife. And I just, you know, I looked at her that day, and I just, just took the high road and just turned up my nose like bitch, you, and walked off. That's that's pretty much what I did. But I, I want to share that experience with y'all because that's what, like I said, these are the types of things that I go through. This is the reason why, one of the reasons why I became the dark skin activist, you know, to speak about these things that happen to dark skin people on a day to day basis. when we just live in our lives, just trying to be. Next, moving right along. Oh, the Pantene commercial. I want to talk to y'all about the Pantene commercial. And I want to thank y'all again for tuning in. Y'all taking time out of y'all, y'all precious schedule to watch me. And I just love it because I love, 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 love y'all. I really do. I love all my supporters out there. And um, I want to talk about the Pantene commercial that really pissed me off. You know, y'all know I'm a, a huge fan of Lauren Hill. I named my daughter after Lauren Hill. So sometimes I get in the mood to listen to some Lauren Hill. So I was listening to, I went to go look on YouTube to listen to a Lauren Hill song. And lo and fucking behold, this commercial pops up. Y'all know how those ads pop up on the screen before you get to see the video. And it's of these NFL dads. It's a Pantene-sponsored commercial of these NFL dads and their daughters. Now, I will say the concept was excellent. You, you got fathers spending time with their daughters. You got fathers doing the little girl's hair, which a lot of them really didn't know how to do, but at least they was trying. So I love the concept. But yet again, an instance of dark skin discrimination, as you guys probably already figured. So you had this black guy with dreadlocks in his head. He had a mixed race child with, she had long hair like a mixed race child. Y'all know what I'm talking about. There was a white guy on there with his, his little daughter. And then there was a black guy on there that had his daughter. And she was, she was like kind of light brown skin and she had a perm. There was no dark skin little girls with kinky hair. Another instance of dark skin discrimination. And I just said to myself, you know, again, it's pretty much saying to dark skin girls that you are not valuable. And, they, and, and, and this is teaching these girls at a young age. Because these girls were probably no older than 10. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you, the, the, what about the little dark skin girls that look at YouTube, that's watching these videos? They don't see themselves. How do you think they feel? Do you think they feel valuable? And I said to myself, first of all, I've never been um, a huge buyer of the product uh, Pantene, but I'm never going to buy a Pantene product ever a fucking again. Never. The only way I might even consider buying a product from them is if they do a whole campaign with nothing but dark skinned people in it. Dark skinned girls, dark skinned women, dark skinned, dark skinned. I'm not going to, I encourage all of you not to buy their fucking products because if they don't have the decency, I mean, they had two black men on there, two. If they didn't have the decency to at least say, you know what? I'm going to pick a black man that has a child that's of the darker skin tone. And these white people ain't stupid. Don't let them fool you. Don't let them. Some of these white people, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing when they deal with skin tone issues. Some of them try to act like, oh, you know what? I'm just learning about this. This is a black issue. No. They know what they're doing. And a lot of these big companies, they have black people working for them, scouting for them. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm pretty sure that there had to be some, some uh, black person on the team that put that commercial together. I'm pretty sure. Because you had black NFL football players in there. And you call yourself dealing with black hair. So you mean to tell me, again, just like with the rap game, you mean to tell me you couldn't find one visibly black-looking, dark-skinned girl with a grain of hair like mine? Really, Pantene? Well, guess what? Fuck you. Because Rashida Strober, the dark-skinned activist, will never buy your fucking products. I don't need your fucking products. You see, they, spend, they get all this money off black people. They get all this money off of us. But they continue to fucking disrespect us. And it's at some point where we got to stop and say, we're not going to let this happen anymore. You know, we're not going to buy your products. 
we're not going to support you, you know, it, it, because you, you don't, you don't want to represent us. And there's enough black owned hair companies out there to where we don't have to do that. There's even a lot of black women. I want to say shout out to all the black women on YouTube that make the natural hair videos. The um, There's one uh, black woman on YouTube that makes a, 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 a natural hair video with her daughters. They have like real long hair. They are so beautiful, beautiful little dark skinned girls. I want to say shout out to y'all. And if y'all start making products, let me tell you, I will support it. I will support. I even went and, and hunted down Madam C.J. Walker. Y'all need to do some research. If you don't know who Madam C.J. Walker is, she was the first female millionaire in the United States. Way before Oprah, there was Madam C.J. Walker. She was a dark-skinned black woman, and she built an industry off of hair care, off of black hair care. You know what I'm saying? And I did some research, and I found out that her company is still in operation today. So I encourage you guys, if you're going to buy black hair products, which we all know that black women have to have, we have to have some type of, cause you know, we have beautiful hair, but we do have to keep it moisturized. We do have to keep it looking good Buy black, Buy black. You know, there's a, like I said, there's a lot of black female YouTubers that have beautiful hair. Some of them have products that they themselves make Buy black. Fuck Pantene. Fuck all these white-owned companies that want to disrespect beautiful, dark-skinned black women and children, you know, by not uh, using them to promote their products. We don't need you. We don't have to spend our money with you. Economic boycott. That's what we need to start doing to these people. And the black men in the, in the, in those commercials, you know, I just said to myself when I saw those black men, because I always say this right here. And some people have gotten mad at me, but I don't, I don't really give a damn. You can always tell a man's mind state, a man's level of consciousness by how their kids look. Yep, you sure can. Always. And anytime you see a black man that do not have children, and a lot of y'all going to get me, a black woman too, I'm going to throw that out there too, that do not have children that look like the reflection of them, it's a problem. It's a problem. You know what I'm saying? And when I saw the commercial with, with, with the black men and their children, their, their little girls, I said to myself, their level of consciousness is non-existent. It's not there. It's not there. So, you know, we can't depend on these on these fools. We got to do for ourselves, uh, dark-skinned black people. We got to, like I said, that we, we can't, Beyonce can never speak for me. She can never represent me. Kathleen Cleaver of the Black Panther Party, she can never speak for me. As a dark-skinned black woman, they can't speak to my experience. I don't need them to speak to me. I don't need them to speak for me because it doesn't make sense for them to speak for me. They've been speaking for black people, for dark-skinned black people, the underdogs, for too long. And then getting all the glory and getting all the, the credit, just capitalizing. You know what I'm saying? I don't need you to speak for me. It's okay to support the dark skin empowerment equality movement. I'm not saying that it's not okay, but I don't need you to be the, at the forefront of it. I don't need you to represent me. Like I said, if Kelly Rowland would have uh, done that, that whole Black Panther thing, it would have been more authentic. I could have supported that. But Beyonce, no, no, you, you, you can't speak for me. You can't speak for me. Moving right along. Now, I want to talk about a movie that I watched. And this is Black History Month. So this, this ties directly in with Black History Month. This ties directly in with darkism. Y'all, I want y'all to look out for my book, Darkism, 25 Ways That Dark-Skinned People Are Discriminated Against. So let me tell y'all about this movie called The Butler. And some of y'all may have seen this movie. I believe it was probably produced by Oprah Winfrey and... um. What's that man's name? I can't think of his name. Lee Daniels. That's his name. Um, anyway, the butler was about a black man who he was enslaved. His parents were enslaved and he was in slavery for a brief period of time. But his mother was raped by a white man and his father got very upset and he, he, he attacked the white man and his father was killed by the white man and the 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 uh person that played the butler um it was Forrest Whitaker but it's, this is actually based on a true story 
So the, the character, the butler, he witnessed this happen when he was a little boy. And so what happened after that, the mother of the white man who had shot his father dead, she decided to call herself taking him in and teach him how to be a house nigga. And that's how they referred to it in the movie. Now, I had several issues with this movie. And first of all, let me say the experience of this man uh, who was the butler was just it was just appalling. And it was just I'm, I'm glad that they told the story because the story needed to be, to be told. Um, this, this is the black experience of what we went through uh, in slavery and the after effects of slavery and how it impacted our lives. And so for that, I applaud them for telling this man's story because it was a very important story. But there were some things that I wanted to point out. Now, number one, Mariah Carey, and we know how Mar Mariah Carey looks. She is a mulatto mixed race woman. She played the mother of the, the character that was the butler. And this man, the butler, was dark skinned and the dad was dark skinned. So I don't know. It's not clear whether or not the real life mother of this character, the butler, whether his mother was a mulatto. But if if, if, if she was, then I'm glad that they did a, a proper casting of this character. But if she wasn't and if she was a dark skinned woman and, and the only reason why I'm talking about this is because we know that during slavery, that the mulattoes, the light-skinned people, they were not outside working in the fields. And his mother was actually outside. Mariah Carey was playing his mother in the movie. She was outside working in the fields. And I said to myself, I wonder if his, if the real woman, the real mother, was actually a mulatto. Because we know that mulattoes were not field Negroes. They were house Negroes. So if she was not actually a mulatto, then what I want to say to the producers of that movie, shame on you. And that is a, an example of darkism because a dark skinned woman should have been cast in that role and not Mariah Carey. If in fact his mother was not actually a mulatto because it just doesn't line up with history. So that was one issue that I had with the movie. Another issue that I had with the movie, and I wrote this down and I'm going to show y'all, I'm going to go back to my screen sharing because y'all got to see, I wrote down their names. Now, this movie was about black oppression, black suffering, pretty much slavery and what happened after slavery and all the sufferings and oppressions that these primarily dark skinned black people had to go through. So explain to me why. Explain to me why you had black men, all the black men in this movie that, that were playing the title supporting roles in their real life. They don't have nothing to do with no authentically black woman that looks like me. Explain to me why. It's fucked up. And I don't care anything about people saying, oh, well, they're actors. That's a bunch of bullshit. I just find it to be highly ironic and highly fucked up that all the men that were in this movie about the oppression of black people, dark skinned black people in real life, none of them fuck with dark black women. Let me show y'all. I'm finna screen share. The first person, his name is. David Oyelo. I hope I got his name right. Hold on one second. Bear with me because I'm finish. I'm finna show y'all exactly what I'm talking about and why I be so um, upset. Watch this. Now this guy is married. This 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 is him right here. Bear with me one second. He's married to. Hold up. A white woman. He played the son of the butler, okay? Why, explain to me, why do these men get to benefit off of stories, movies that make millions of dollars? Why do they, why do they benefit economically? Why do they benefit on a status level because it helps to bolster their careers? Why the hell do they get to benefit off of black struggle when in real life, look who they're dealing with? Explain that to me, folks. Let's keep moving right along. I want to show y'all who else? Lenny Kravitz. He was also in the movie. I'm going to show y'all. A lot of y'all already know who he was dealing with, who he was, who he had a baby from. But you, in a movie about black oppression, playing opposite black women, authentically black looking women. Another character, Terrence Howard. Now, Terrence Howard, when he was, he was, uh, he played, um, uh, Oprah Winfrey's character who were, who was, who was married to 
uh, the title character, the butler, he played the character, hold on, Lauren, he played the character that was having an affair with Oprah. And when I watched that scene with him and Oprah, I'm just looking like, really? Really? You, you, you're in a love scene with Oprah Winfrey, but look at who you're married to. I know you had to put forth a lot of effort when you were in that scene. Look at who you're married to. Moving right along. Um, Cuba Gooding Jr. Bear with me, folks. Cuba Gooding Jr. There, no, that's not, there he is. There he is. You know what? Cuba Gooding Jr., I'm, I ain't going to even tell y'all no lie. When he came out with Boys in the Hood, I'm telling you, this is when I was naive, young, dumb, didn't know what the hell was going on. I had the biggest crush on this man. Oh, my God. I was completely and madly in love with Trey, Cuba Gooding's character in Boys in the Hood. And years later, when I found out that this man was married to a non-dark-skinned, non-black woman, I was just, I was just completely in awe, folks. I was just completely upset. I just couldn't believe it. I felt betrayed. I felt, I felt like he was a liar. I felt like, you know, he wasn't real. I just felt like, you know, you know, I, I, I felt like the betrayal that I feel so much from a lot of black men who say one thing and who do another, you know, who have stabbed me in my back. Because I've had a lot of black men that have actually stabbed me in my back. And I love black men to death. You know, I'm very loyal to black men. I'm very, I'm very loyal to our, our struggle. And so when I see, I remember Trey watching him. I, I haven't seen Boys in the Hood like so many times I can't even count. That's why I said when I grew up and I found out that this man was, you know, married to this non-black woman and watching him in all these movies about black struggle. He was in Tus Tuskegee Airmen. He was, um, he's been in a lot of black movies. And it's like, how could you even sleep at night playing these characters of black struggle and then you go and you turn around and you not even with your black woman? How fucking dare you? How fucking dare you? Anyway, let me get, let me, let me, I'm, I'm um, close out this, uh, <clears throat> this screen sharing. And you guys are going to be able to see me again. Okay. So I hope you guys, I hope you guys saw the pictures that I was just showing you. Um, David O, I'm going to call him David O because I could barely pronounce his last name. Hold on one second. I just showed you guys Lenny Kravitz, Terrence Howard, and Cuba Gooding Jr. Yet none of these men have black wives, let alone dark-skinned black wives. And to me, that's a damn form of darkism. You see, darkism occurs in relationships. Make no, no doubt about that. Darkism is big in relationships. And it happens primarily among, and y'all a lot of y'all going to be mad with me for saying this. I just had somebody back out. I just had a black man back out of an interview that he was supposed to do with me. He said that he agreed that dark-skinned people are discriminated against, but he's building his organization and he's for all, for everybody. See, that's the thing. No one wants to deal with the big elephant in the room. Everyone wants to run scared. And that's why they're mad at me because they know I don't give a fuck. I don't care. I'm going to say what I got to say. I'm going to call a spade a spade. I'm going to talk about this shit. I'm not going to stop talking about it until it stops. The day dark skin discrimination stops, the day that black men marry and date dark-skinned women in equal numbers the day that black men in the entertainment industry promote dark-skinned women on the same level that they promote these non-dark-skinned women, the day that all this dark-skinned discrimination stops is the day that you'll hear me shut up because then my work will be done. But until then, I'm going to keep speaking about the big elephant in the room and I'm not going to stop. And it makes a lot of people uncomfortable because most of them people, they perpetuating that shit. See, everybody ain't real. Along my journey, I found out that everybody ain't real. They smile in your face. They pretend that they like you. They pretend that they support you, but they will stab you in your fucking back. I'm telling you, it's happened to me. I speak from experience. Everything I say, I speak from experience. From experience. Moving right along. I want to talk, finish talking about this movie and talk about the butler, the main character, the butler. Now, 
This this man, I told y'all, he came from the legacy of slavery. His parents were slaves. He watched his father gunned down by a white man. And he was basically taken in. Don't bother with that, Lauren. Put that over there. He was basically taken in by this white woman who taught him how to be a house Negro. And as a result of this, he became a butler. There was a black man that came along that was a, a butler that had a lot of experience as a butler. And he kind of picked up where the white woman left off and taught him more things and actually got him a job. So all that led up to him uh, becoming a butler in the White House. And he was a butler through about four presidential administrations. And it was just so sad to watch how he was treated. He and other black people during that era were treated by white people. These butlers basically could not be human beings. They could not share their thoughts, feelings, or emotions. They had, it was still a form of slavery. The white people still talked to them in such a way, you know, where they, their feelings really didn't exist that in a way where they were just there to serve the white people. It was, it was modern day slavery. It was just, they were getting paid. You know what I'm saying? And so it was just very, a very painful and degrading thing to watch this man go through. And his wife didn't work. Oprah Winfrey played his wife. She didn't work. She was a stay at home mom. He worked his ass off, spent long hours in there dealing with all that degrading shit. Yes, sir. You know, all the ways that they used to have to talk to these white people and all this kind of stuff and stuff that would never fly. A damn show ain't gonna fly with me in 2016. You know what I'm saying? You're going to respect me as a human being. We're going to respect each other. There's going to be mutual respect. So this man had to, he, he sat through, he worked through four presidential administrations dealing with this. And at the end of the movie, what they painted as a triumph for this man, the butler who had sat through, this dark-skinned man who had sat through all of these presidential administrations where he had been basically demeaned by white people. I think it was the meaning, but I understood the man had to do what he had to do, you know, to support his family. At the end of the movie, the triumph was basically that Barack Obama, because this man who was the butler, and remember this was based on a true story, he lived to see the uh, Barack Obama become the first so-called black president, and that's what I took issue with. You see, it's going back to Beyonce situation where the non dark skinned people always get a chance to, to bask in the glory of any triumphs that black people have because they are the ones that get to represent black people. You see, it's a hierarchy. You know what I'm saying? And the, 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 the darker skinned people are at the bottom. And as you go up the hierarchy, it's based on color. It really is within the black community. The lighter skinned people are at the top. They running things. And so in this, in this movie, the Butler, Barack Obama, the fact that they, you know, perpetuated Barack Obama and his presidency as this big monumental event in black history and him as this representation of this, this black triumph. To me, that's the tragedy, because why is it fair that this mixed race man gets to take the credit for being the first black president? He's not the first black president. He's the first mulatto president. I believe in giving credit to where it's due. I believe in being intellectually honest. And we're not being intellectually honest by calling Barack Obama President Barack Obama. And I respect him as such. But we're not giving credit to what credit is due when we call him the first black president. We are, as, as far as I'm concerned, we are disrespecting all these black people, these authentically black, dark skinned people who have suffered. Barack Obama, that he suffered during his lifetime, working through all those presidential administrations where he had to go through all the hell that he went through. To at the end, when he finally was done, the, 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 the triumph was this mixed race man being given credit as the first black president. It's just... It was just a travesty. I think I got some questions coming in, guys. Hold on one second. Let me just get on, hop on Facebook right now because I think I have some questions coming in from some people here. Um, oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I got some people. That's, they got some comments here. Thank you, guys, to all of you that are sending me these kind comments, telling me that they like the video. Thank y'all for watching it. I appreciate it. I'm glad y'all like it. Um, I do this for y'all. I'm the dark skin activist. I'm never going to stop. 
You can always count on me to work for equality, the equal treatment of dark skinned people all over the world. Um, I was going to end at 10 o'clock, but I'm not done yet because I want to cover some um, another topic. And I'm pretty much done with the butler. I, I pretty much said what I had to say about that. And that movie, it, 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 it made me cry it, 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 and it pissed me off at the same time. So, you know, that's how I feel about the butler. I'm going to move right along. I want to talk about Nayara Justino. And I've got a lot of messages about uh, Nayara Justino. Now, this young lady, and I took some notes, she is the 2013 Globaleza Carnival Queen, okay? Um, and I actually have a picture of her. So just bear with me. I'm about to screen share again so you guys could get a visual of who I'm talking about. This beautiful dark-skinned woman. I mean, absolutely gorgeous. When y'all see her, you're going to see what I mean. And this is, this is why I know that these people are jealous. They're just envious because anytime you try to hold back, you know what I'm saying, a dark-skinned woman, and you know that the woman is beautiful, and you know that there's nothing wrong with her, um, you, you, you're doing it just based on color, you're jealous. Y'all see that? This is Nayara Justino. Nayara Justino. She is the 2013 Globaliza Carnival Queen. This woman was voted by the people over in uh, Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. She was voted by the people as the Carnival Queen. She was apparently the first dark-skinned Carnival Queen. Before her, all the Carnival Queens were light-skinned. So as Carnival Queen, they got a chance to do a lot of representation um, of Brazil through, you know, film, television, photo shoots, and that kind of thing, through a TV network called Globo, which is the largest TV network in Brazil, okay? So when this woman started to take photos and, you know, she started to get some exposure and they were putting her out there, there started to be a backlash. People started to get jealous of her and hate on her because she's dark-skinned. They were calling her all kinds of names. Um, I read um, some of the, she said some of the comments that people put on Facebook were monkey darky now look at this woman y'all see this woman clearly she's beautiful clearly flawless skin nice body you know what i'm saying beautiful face beautiful hair clearly she's beautiful anybody that looks at this woman and says that she's ugly is fucking lying they're just jealous and you know that's why i say when people come at me and say, you know, people have told me, oh, you know what? It's not your dark skin. It's your features. Even if you were light skinned, you'd still be ugly. Well, guess what? I'm pointing out a picture. Y'all can see it right here of a beautiful dark skinned woman. Explain to me why the fuck she's getting all this backlash. Explain to me why she being called monkey. Explain to me why did Globo get rid of her and replace her with a light-skinned woman if what I'm saying is so crazy. Explain that one to me. I want y'all to explain that shit to me. It's darkism, plain and simple. It's what I've been saying for years. It's what's been going down for years. It's the big elephant in the room. And if you really cared about it, you'd be honest about it and speak the truth. You'd be honest about it and you speak the truth. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's just a damn shame, you know, and I just, I just wanted to, to speak on her and I don't know if she's, if she ever watched this video, I just want her to know, I'm going to stop screen sharing guys. I just want her to know that I'm in full support of her and what she's doing. Um, there's even a documentary that's coming out where she's explaining her experience about what she went through with being replaced as the carnival queen. She was replaced with a light-skinned woman. And this is nothing new because even I'm, I'm going to do a whole um, series on that. That's coming up. Dark-skinned women being replaced by non-dark-skinned women in TV is nothing new to me. I've seen it go down before. You know, it's, it's happened on American TV. See, this thing is all over the world. This dark-skinned discrimination that we experience is all over the world. You know, that's why I say to people, you know, y'all, you know, you, you want to call me crazy? You want to call me divisive? I'm not crazy. I'm not divisive. I'm just simply speaking the truth. I'm telling the truth. 
And the question is, what the hell are we going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And that's, that's really my question. That's really how I want to end this Google Hangout. What's wrong, Lauren? You fix it for you. That's really how I want to end this Google Hangout. I want to leave y'all with the question of what are we going to do about it? Are you going to sit back in your families, on your jobs, you know, in your relationships and continue to watch darkism go down? Or are you going to do something about it? Are you going to do something about it? There's a solution to every problem that we have. There's a solution to every problem. So my question to you, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> I want to thank y'all so much for taking the time to watch this um, Google Hangout tonight. I'm going to be doing more of this uh, because I love to speak to the people. I get a lot of questions. And this is a, a, an easier way of answering people's questions, uh, the topics, the commentary that people have for me. It's, a, you know, to get to y'all because I be busy doing so much stuff. Like I got so much stuff coming up, so much stuff I'm doing around dark skin activism. So if I don't like get back with you, like with the messages, like real fast, just know it's not anything personal. It's just because I be like doing so much stuff. And oh, my God, I got to get my, my friend Theo on here. Theo, I hope you're watching because me and you are going to do a Google Hangout and we're going to let these people know what took place, what happened to you in that Texas jail, the brand of darkism that you experienced in that Texas jail. I want people to know about it, okay? Um, I want to thank y'all so much for watching. I want y'all to look out for my upcoming book. I'm about to release it real soon. I'm working real hard on it. It's called Darkism. 25 ways that dark skinned people are discriminated against. If you have some topics that you want me to talk about, you can Facebook me. Um, you can email me, dark skin is beautiful campaign at gmail.com and support the dark skin is beautiful campaign. Support the dark skin activists. Hey, look, guys, I produce shows, a dark skin woman's revenge, all over the United States. I do this. I, do, I don't just talk, I'm a person of action. Action speaks louder than words, and that's what I'm all about. So you can, there's many ways to support this. You can go to my website, thedarkskinactivist.com, and you can get my, I got a free ebook there, How to Be the Hottest Dark Skin Chick on the Planet. I love that book. That's absolutely free. You can get A Dark Skin Woman's Revenge, the book I wrote. You can also get She Black, But She Ain't Ugly, A Dark Skin Girl's Triumph. You can get that, or you can donate to the campaign. Just go to my GoFundMe. So there's lots of ways to support. And just by y'all taking the time out, let me tell you, taking the time out, to watch me, I y'all just don't know. I am so honored. I'm so appreciative. I love y'all to death. You know, I want to thank all my supporters out there. Uh, Mecca, um, Keith Pipebone, Howard, uh, um, Theo, um, Carla, let's see, um, uh, Dexter. It's so many people. Oh, my God. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I love y'all. Glenn, thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody, just for supporting me, and just know I'm never going to stop. There's some big things in store. I'm telling you right now. This thing is this thing is worldwide. I'm going to keep pushing it. I'm not going to stop. The Dark Skin Activist is here, Rashida Strober, and for you haters out there that's trying to tell me that I didn't invent dark skin activism, I invented dark skin activism. The first, the world's first dark skin activist. This is historic. This is Black History Month. Y'all looking at history right here in the making. I've made history when other people ignored the dark skin issue. I was there right front and center speaking out on it boldly, unapologetically. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be right here and I'm going to keep producing. I'm going to keep coming up with results. And y'all know y'all can always contact me. I'm here for you. I love you. I can't say that enough because I love you from the bottom of my heart. And I want equality. I want equality for dark skin women, men, and children. I want equality for everybody. But let's be honest. Like I said before, we know, we know that dark skin people bear the brunt of the discrimination experienced by anybody in the world. We know this. This is not rocket science. I'm not even saying anything new. This has been going on for hundreds of years. But it's going to stop as long as God gives me the strength and the ability I'm never going to stop. I'm never going to quit. That's the one thing I learned. You never give up. You never stop. You keep pushing until you accomplish, until you climb that mountain, until you get what you want. And that is exactly what y'all should do. So I want to thank you guys so much for taking the time to watch me. 